distributed tracing is great, then why don't we see it everywhere? Right? Everybody is doing uh, logging. Everybody is collecting generic metrics. Why don't we see distributed tracing deployed for every application? Here's a hint. I've been told it's mandatory to put an XKCD comic on every tech talk, so there you go. <laughs> we'll get to this, <laughs> this one later. I'm Johannes. Um, here are my contact details, and this is what I look like on GitHub. I work at Kinfolk, where we do cool uh, Linux and Kubernetes stuff, and I'm also a contributor to the Open Telemetry project. Uh, we at Kinfolk are quite a small company, uh, but we're pretty uh, active in the open source community, uh, especially around Linux and Kubernetes. Um, we work al almost exclusively in the open, so if you haven't heard about us, you should check us out. This is what we'll talk about. Uh, we'll start with a 30-second introduction to distributed tracing, just in case you haven't heard what it is. Um, next, we'll look at some main challenges the community is facing today with regards to distributed tracing. Um, we'll introduce the Open Telemetry project in general and specifically its Go library. We'll demo instrumenting a distributed Go application. And finally, we'll take a very short peek into some of the implementation details of the Go library. So, who has at least some experience with distributed tracing? Any project? Okay, that's cool. Uh, this is an advanced talk, uh, labeled as an advanced talk, so it assumes you know what distributed tracing is and have at least some experience with a tracing library. However, in case you're completely new to distributed tracing, here it is in 30 seconds. So, you instrument your application by importing some library into your code. Library gathers data about what's going on inside your application, ships this data to some tracing backend. And you get fancy graphs, which allow you to get both a high-level and a deep-down view for every transaction ha handled by your uh, application, no matter how many services are involved. Right. Lastly, we need to know what a span is. So a span measures a unit of work within a service, and it traces a collection of spans with parent-child relationships between them. That's it. This is basically distributed tracing. Cool. So why doesn't everybody do distributed tracing? Everybody does logging, everybody does metrics, et cetera. Why not tracing, which has the potential of being arguably much more powerful, right? Uh, let's look at some of the main challenges with tracing. First of all, it's a lot of work, right? Instrumentation usually requires changing your code, right? And good luck you know, trying to convince one team to lower their output just to have tracing enabled. Maybe they don't care about tracing, right? But if the service that the team is responsible for is in the request chain, they have to do instrumentation, otherwise things will break, right? So it's hard to justify reducing your team's velocity for the benefit of tracing. Uh, as I said, you cannot have instrumentation holes, so at the very least, even if you don't care about capturing spans, you must propagate context in order for a trace not to break. We'll talk about context a little bit later. Secondly, nobody wants to marry their monitoring vendor. Right? I mean, nobody wants to feel they're married to vendors at all, but with tracing, it is especially uh, painful because, I mean, you have tracing statements sprayed across your entire code base, and I mean, if the bloody vendor decides to raise prices, what are you going to do? Refactor, refactor your whole application. And so, right, it's tricky. And lastly, open source libraries must remain neutral, right? You wouldn't use a web framework that requires you to open a new Relic account or, I don't know, Datadog, right? So, yeah, that's another aspect of it. Um, and also, monitoring vendors um, typically use their custom protocols or may use custom protocols in order to transmit metrics to the uh, tracing backend. So maintaining support for Datadog, New Relic, uh, Instana, AppDynamics, I don't know what, it's going to be a pain if you're, you're just a maintainer of some library, right? And lastly, some people go as far as claiming that distributed tracing in its very nature stands in contrast to microservices, right? Um, any Peter Bergen followers in the crowd? OK, if you don't follow him, I recommend that you do. Uh, if you do follow him, you may have seen these tweets. He says, he says, basically, microservices architecture is intended to maximize team velocity and independence above everything else. Requiring everybody to use the same technology contradicts this idea. Tracing requires everybody to use the same technology. Therefore, tracing doesn't work with microservices, right? 
So what does this mean? Does this mean that you cannot trace microservices? It's stupid because tracing was, distributed tracing was built for microservices, right? So I wouldn't go as far as saying that. It could be, this could be a little uh, extreme opinion, but in my opinion, it does require a very delicate balance, striking a very delicate balance between freedom and uniformity, right? So we need to find like the right way of enforcing, but still allowing freedom. Now combine the previous three points with the fact that we have multiple everything, and you can possibly get an explanation why distributed tracing is so difficult. Right? We have multiple microservices, possibly written in multiple languages by multiple teams. Services communicate in a bunch of ways, HTTP, gRPC, messaging, etc., etc. There are multiple tracing backends, both open source ones like Jaeger, Zipkin, and commercial ones like Datadog, New Relic, etc. So yeah. Is there a solution? Well, kind of. We'll have to see about that. Uh, but let's look at some nice attempts which have been done in that direction. Remember this? Standards, yay. So at some point, the open source community figured that we needed a standard for tracing because not having a standard makes everything pretty difficult, even impractical, right? And that's what we did. A tracing standard has emerged, open tracing. But we didn't stop there. In fact, we've been so psyched about having a standard that we created two of them. So let's talk about this too very briefly. Open Tracing is a CNCF project which standardizes the tracing APIs. It does not contain an implementation, it just standardizes the APIs. It, re it was released December 2016, and some of its notable contributors are Lightstep, Uber, Instana, SolarWinds, New Relic, the list goes on. Supported by multiple tracing backends as well, which are often also the contributors to this project. And Open Census, it's a Google project which has been open sourced. It contains an implementation, unlike Open Tracing. Released a little later, contributions from Google, Microsoft, Splunk, etc., and supported by a bunch of other um, uh, tracing backends, sometimes with overlap to Open Tracing. So for a while now, users, users have had to decide whether they want to instrument their code using Open Tracing or Open Census, right? Uh, the two are not really, weren't, weren't really compatible, which is problematic because having multiple standards is similar to having no standards at all. The good news is, on May last year, the Open Tracing and Open Census projects announced they, they decide to unite behind, behind a new front. Um, so a single open source standard for distributed tracing, which is called Open Telemetry. Um, open Telemetry is the next major version of both Open Tracing and Open Census, which means that both of the older projects are going to be discontinued. Now, it's a real community effort, in my opinion, quite a unique one, because it's a product of collaboration between many companies that are often direct competitors. But they still decided to do this one standard because standards are so important for this complex idea called tracing. The project itself is a spec, and a set of libraries for multiple programming languages. Um, and it supports both tracing and metric collection, traditional metric collection, Prometheus, whatever. Right? In this talk, we'll focus only on tracing, though. So metrics is out of scope. What does the architecture look like at the high level? So we have a specification, a spec, that defines a standard way to do distributed tracing, and it is language agnostic, vendor agnostic, doesn't matter, it just defines what tracing should work like. Now, each library has an API, which follows the specification, basically implements the specification. Um, and the API can be used without plugging in a specific implementation, right? Which is a very, very important principle in this design. Uh, so there is a default no-op implementation built into the API. So if you're using an instrumented library or even instrumenting your own service, you don't have to click the enable tracing button in order for the code to work, right? You can have an instrumented code which compiles, but doesn't necessarily produce traces. We've got an SDK, which is a ready-to-use implementation of the API. It could potentially become the canonical implementation of the project, but you could write your own, there could be alternatives, etc. The SDK takes care of the actual spam creation, things like context propagation, sampling, lots of other stuff. This is where the low-level details are. And we have exporters, which are responsible for delivering tracing data to tracing backends. These are vendor specific. We have a Jaeger exporter, a Datadog exporter, whatever. Um, bridges, 
they are the last part. They, they don't show up here in this architecture because they are not like an integral part of the design, but they are important nonetheless because they allow you to easily migrate from open tracing and open census to open telemetry. So if you have, a, you have a Go application that is already instrumented using open tracing, for example, you can already use open telemetry today. You don't have to change anything. You just change uh, three lines in a, somewhere in the main function, right, when you initialize everything. So you don't need to re-instrument. So this design gives us a nice separation of concerns. As a library developer, an open source library, I depend only on the API. I don't care about the implementation. I cannot really know what implementation the end user will choose. Right? As an application developer or the end user um, of, of, of the tracing uh, project, um, I consume the API, uh, so I depend on it, and I also select an, an implementation, configure it, and plug it into the API. Right? Um, this is done typically once in some global whatever init function or in main, um, and then I can instrument my whole app. Monitoring ven vendors, they maintain the exporters, which was not the case with the previous projects. Uh, so it makes a lot of sense because they know their proprietary protocols the best. Um, the open telemetry design is empathic to user code. So you don't have to use tracing, like I said, if you don't want to. Uh, even if you're importing some library, generic library that is in, uh, instrumented, you don't have to enable tracing. Your code will compile anyway, and performance impact is reduced to a minimum by not blocking as far as possible. No implementation is very lightweight and uh, we ship metrics data synchronously to the backend. Project status, um, still under active development. Most libraries are still expected to undergo a lot of change before GA, hopefully by the end of uh, this year. Um, we already have a bunch of libraries for different languages. Go, Python, Java, list goes on. Uh, the Go library is fairly new. It's one of the newest uh, libraries. However, you can already get useful tracing with it today. And if something breaks, PRs are welcome. Um, here's the current status of the Go library. So we have an API, we have an SDK. We do a context propagation. We have exporters for Jaeger, Stackdriver, Prometheus uh, for metrics. And we have an open tracing bridge. The open census, uh, not yet. So let's see some code. This is basically how I instrument my application. I can start a span by calling the start method on my tracer. And I stop the span by deferring span.end. That's it, basically. This is like the, the, the very basic idea. I can also start and stop a span uh, implicitly by wrapping my code using uh, the decor decorator style with span method. Um, this method creates a span, execute my stuff, then ends the span automatically. I can enrich my spans with useful data. Add event allows me to log um, stuff, events, during my span's lifetime. These logs will appear in context inside the span. We can demonstrate that uh, in a bit. And I can set attributes, which is basically arbitrary key value pairs to allow easy filtering, whatever it is. Yeah. Now, we have to explain a little bit about context before we can um, completely understand instrumentation. Um, distributed tracing relies heavily on a pattern called context propagation. Now, for that, we need to understand what context means. Uh, to me personally, when I was first introduced to tracing, this was one of the most confusing aspects. So um, context is basically request scoped data. This is the simplest way that I could, simplest definition that I could find for it. Uh, things like transaction ID, user ID, I don't know, something could be authentication info. Um, and context is propagated typically across the request path. If I have six microservices handling a request, it would be the same context in all of them more or less. Now distributed tracing uses context in order to correlate spans that are generated by various goroutines, various services, whatever it is. So we need to correlate things both within a process in memory and over the network across or among multiple services. In-process context propagation is handled for us, luckily, by the library. So we don't need to worry about that with regards to instrumentation. However, um, distributed context propagation is explicit, at least in the Go library, which means that I need to know uh, about the inject and extract methods when I'm instrumenting, all right? Um, this is protocol specific, so uh, typically the context information is conveyed in things like HTTP headers, um, gRPC metadata, protocol dependent, so there is no one solution. Um, but normally these packages like the HTTP package or gRPC package have the standard methods inject and extract. Inject takes context information and serializes it on the wire and extract does the opposite. Okay? Typically you're using inject when you're a client and you're using extract when you're a server. 
Okay, uh, time for a demo. Now that we know all this, let's look at it in practice. I will demo a completely useless application. Um, I really like fake job titles like, I don't know, executive uh, strategy coordinator or things like that. So I wrote a little application that generates random ones for you. Uh, we have a front-end service which handles HTTP requests from clients. The front-end service talks to three back-end services over gRPC. Each back-end service generates a piece of the title. And if you see your own title on the screen during this demo, you may have been tricked. They're all fake. Looks like it works. Here are our services. Wow, I have a massive delay here. Okay, we'll manage. Uh, Frontend, this is the front-end service. Um, let's look at its implementation. I'm skipping the main function. I'm initializing tracing infrastructure here. So any trace provider, let me jump to this function here. This is like boilerplate code. You can mostly copy paste it. And again, you do it once. This is not the actual instrumentation. It's just preparing for the instrumentation. I'm going to use Jaeger as an exporter. Here is where Jaeger sits. It's running as a Docker container in the background. Uh, here are some global tags that I want to attach to each uh, span, to every span, uh, erroring out if there is a problem, and binding the exporter and the, the uh, trace provider together. This is, again, just boilerplate code. Once I've done that, I can instantiate a tracer, like I do here. Um, and now I can do tr.start to create a span, which I'm doing a little later. Um, here I'm opening three connections, three gRPC client connections to my backend services. Um, this is just copy-paste code. Could have put it in a function, but I was lazy. Um, yeah, and user HTTP handler. So this is the interesting part of the uh, service that we want to capture. So immediately, the first thing that I'm doing um, uh, after starting this handler is creating a a span, right? Which is this here. Creating a span and deferring span.n so I don't forget to end this once the handler returns. That's it, basically. Now I'm handling the request. I'm going to skip the details here that are not too interesting. I'm fetching things over gRPC. I mean, they are interesting. They're just not relevant to tracing. Um, and then before writing the response, I'm logging it to the span so I can see the JSON response on the respective span. Let's look at one of the gRPC services. The three are exactly the same except for their names and the contact that they return. Same thing, any trace provider, just generic boilerplate. Now with gRPC, this is a little different, right? Because the, the Go gRPC library abstracts away the request for me, the HTTP2 request. I cannot see it here. It's handled inside the library. Now, the Go gRPC library happens to be not instrumented by Open Geometry. So what do I do? How do I get access to the request, right? So gRPC uses protobuf. This is my handler. This is what, where my business logic sits. But as you can see, this is just business logic. There is no HTTP request here. Luckily enough, the library gives us sort of a hook. Um, there is a mechanism called interceptor that can basically allows me to define a function that will run on every request, be it a client request or a service request. Right? So I can decide to respond only to incoming requests or only to outgoing requests. Um, in case you've seen this thing here, when I'm creating the gRPC connection to the server, I'm defining a unary server interceptor. I'm jumping to this function, it's in a separate file. And here I'm actually doing the stuff, right? So the interesting part is this. First of all, I'm extracting tracing information that I may have received from an upstream service. And then I'm instantiating a span. Now here, it's not very useful, right? Because I'm only creating the span here. However, the metadata and the logging information that I want to add, I must add them in my handler. But since I created the span here, it is now in memory the current span. So going back to my handler here, I can query my tracer for, uh, I can ask the tracer, what's the current span right now? Then I get it as a struct, and now I can operate on it. So it's the same span that was created by the gRPC interceptor. All right, and then I can add event or tags or whatever. Selected seniority, senior, junior, whatever, executive, um, and the answer. Cool, let's see this in action. Um, this is a very simple UI that demonstrates my very poor React skills. 
Um, generally fake title, junior dolphin manager. All right. Assistant Sox tamer. Junior Sox manager, just a day at the office managing all the Sox. Um, intergalactic engineering trainer. I mean, you get the picture, right? So I can generate fake titles. Now let's see what the tracing looks like. This is Jaeger. I can select a service, doesn't matter which, because all of them are part of the request. Then I can see traces. Nice. Yeah. So here I can see that the parent or the root uh, span is in the front end service because this is the first service in my chain that received the traffic. And I can see that it has some tags. Status code is zero. Message is OK. My exporter is Jaeger. And here's a log. What's in the log? At 1.9 milliseconds, I got generating response. And this is a response. So this is the final JSON that is com uh, compiled of all the three responses that I got from the backend services. And here I can see as child spans the three backend services. So you can see that the timing is a little different. You can see that they are concurrent, concurrent because the spans overlap, right? Um, and we can look at one of them. This is the role service, handle gRPC request, and the role service returned trainer, right? Indeed, this is what it returned. Um, quick requests that work well are rather boring with regards to tracing, so I also created a generate fake title slowly handler <laughs> so that it just looks a little bit different. So yeah, junior penguin trainer. Machinery specialist, original. So let's look at these traces now. We can see already this is like 400 milliseconds. It's way, way slower. The first one was like 2 milliseconds. And now I can see that, yeah, these are serial, and also the handlers sleep for a random amount of milliseconds before returning. Um, yeah, that's basically it. Let's see if I can return to the presentation safely. That's a, yeah, that's a no. <laughs> we'll fix that in a sec. Yeah, I think that should do it. Okay. Now, how is this thing implemented? Um, unfortunately, we don't have time uh, to cover the entire library, so I've chosen one piece of the Go Open Challenge uh, library implementation that, in my opinion, is kind of interesting, uh, which is in-process context propagation. Uh, in-process context propagation, specifically the in-memory one, tends to be uh, possibly the most complex part of tracing libraries for many reasons. Let's understand the problem. Right? Imagine that you're implementing, you're writing the Open Summit Go uh, library now. Now, there is a user here in the green square. Um, they're instrumenting their code, they're doing span.start, whatever, and then they're calling some open source library, a uh, third party library, which luckily is also instrumented using Open Flammetry. Now, this library, the, the user application creates a span, the third party library also needs to create a span, but it needs to be a child of the span created by the user application. How does the third party library get information about the current span? Right? This is not so obvious. Sounds simple, but it's not. Um, so in the case of Go also, by the way, the functions could be Go routines, right? So we need to be thread safe, things could happen concurrently, etc. So there are two main approaches to solving this problem, implicit and explicit. Uh, in implicit in, in process context propagation, we have things like thread local storage or Go routine local storage, which doesn't really exist in Go, at least not, not in the standard library. And we have things like global variables, but yeah, this can be ugly and tricky. Uh, and we have explicit. Explicit is you pass context, object, or struct as an argument to every function. The problem with implicit propagation is that thread local storage can be slow uh, and can also not exist, as, as it is the case with Go. And um, yeah, and we said not all languages support it. The problem with explicit propagation is that you have to modify the function signature of every function in your stack, right? Everything that is in the call chain needs to be modified. Fortunately, we have a Go package uh, called context, which is more or less perfect for this, um, yeah, for this task. So passing a context as the first argument to a function is a very common practice nowadays anyway, 
regardless of tracing, right? There, there is a very good chance if you're writing microservices and you're doing HTTP or an equivalent, you are dealing with context tracks. So if you already do that, you don't need to modify your func function signature to enable tracing, okay? Because the function is, uh, because the uh, context package is so well suited for the task, this is the entire implementation of the in-memory context propagation in Go, right? I happen to uh, work on the Python library for open telemetry, and there it is way, way more complex, right? So that's it, basically. Context usually uh, is used to do a request cancellation. When you cancel the main request, then all the chain is cascadingly canceled, etc. But another feature of the library, which many people don't use, is with value and value, these two methods, right? Um, with value basically uh, allows you to store information about a trace, about whatever, within a context struct, and dot value gets that information. So yeah, this is basically a getter and setter for context. Um, and I, I encourage you guys to explore further as a library. It is very Go-like in the sense that it is simple yet powerful. Will open telemetry make distributed tracing easier? I guess time will tell. But I think we're off to a very good start, and here's why. Open telemetry attempts to address the biggest problems with distributed tracing, right? So as far as it's a lot of work goes, hopefully you'll never have to re-instrument your entire code base ever if you're using open telemetry, right? No matter if you swap vendors, whatever, you want to use a different implementation, everything's fine, right? And there is a neat new feature that's currently in the works called auto-instrumentation. Thanks to that feature, you may even not have to instrument your code once. Um, already exists partially for uh, open tracing. It is mainly a Datadog project, as far as I remember. And yeah, Datadog decided to contribute this project to the open telemetry effort. As far as vendor locking goes, the open telemetry architecture encourages separation of concerns. So libraries depend only on the API. Users can swap implementations on the fly without re instrumenting. And vendors maintain their own exporters because that's the only vendor dependent component. As far as the toughest question, distributed tracing versus microservices, I believe personally that a good balance between freedom and uniformity is the answer. So yes, you do have to standardize on something. You cannot say any team use whatever, that you, whatever you want. But um, this is to date the largest, I mean, open telemetry to date is the largest collaborative effort in this field. So if you have to bet on something, then, then this is probably your best bet. And with the project's flexible design, you may be able to use it for a long time. With that said, I want to thank you all for listening, and it's time for questions. Hi, uh, yeah, no. Hi uh, awesome talk, thank you. Uh, is it possible to pick spans back up? Say I'm answering a request, my service goes down. Upon recovery, I'd like to continue adding to that span because maybe I'm using it to measure response times or uh, performance of my system. Yeah, so basically resume trace creation or span creation, I guess, after a service failure? Correct. So trace creation, yes, because the trace is comprised, uh, it's definitely possible, trace is comprised of multiple spans. Many of them are generated in separate processes, right? So uh, it shouldn't matter, I mean, if service A wrote a span and service B tried to write, to write a span, failed and then rewrote the span, eventually they will converge to the same um, trace. If the uh, service that failed was able to re-get the failed request because the request got also dropped, not just a span, right? Uh, as far as recreating a failed span, I think that, uh, yeah, if, I mean, if the process failed while the span was created and before it was transmitted anywhere, that span is lost. So you could have small holes during failures, I, I would expect, within a trace, yes. Um, yeah. If I had the uh, span, and, uh, span ID still available somewhere, um, because basically all that's lost is the, the span completion that's not sent because my service went down just yet. Yes. Uh, if I still had the span ID, could I get that span back from the tracer and then complete it? Um, if your memory got cleared because uh, the process crashed, then you'd, you'd no longer have the notion of what's the current span ID. You know? So that's going to be tricky, but some backends support, like Jaeger, they support partial traces, by the way. So if you just had a starting uh, span and not the, the end event of a span, you could still see some information about it. I don't know exactly how it will look visually, but yeah. So anything else? Thank you for the talk. Uh, you told that uh, it uh, will support or also a monitoring. So uh, how and when should it be implemented in the program? 
Yeah, so um, metric collection is already supported for Prome in Prometheus format uh, in the Open Telemetry Go library. It's already supported, so it's in alpha mode, but you can already play around with it. Um, yeah, it's just that this talk was about tracing. This is why I didn't mention metrics at all, but this is like um, about 50% about of the tracing library is also uh, metrics. Um, yeah. So uh, will, will the today. metrics work with the same span or another object? Another um, entity? The metrics is kind of a separate functionality, right? I mean, because collecting metrics is, uh, I mean, it's, it's different in, in, in essence, right? Because it's kind of like generic volumetric information. It is not like per transaction thing. So yeah, it doesn't look the same, but you can use the same library to produce traditional old school uh, metrics and you don't have to necessarily have a different project for that. That's cool, thanks. Yeah, sure. Uh, oops. How well supported is open telemetry in middle boxes? Something like Nginx, Haproxy, or service meshes, all those things sitting in the middle between services. Um, yeah, it's just, just another service, basically. I mean, if it gets a request and that request has context information, you should be able to trace it. Um, yes, one of the most... Mm -hmm. Yes, but Nginx explicitly supports open tracing mm -hmm. because Nginx first is a loss balancer and it has its own notations and all kind of stuff. Yeah. And other middle boxes, do they do something special for open telemetry or not? So uh, basically, uh, there are some uh, sort of middleware projects like service meshes that are already instrumented. Um, I can't guarantee that all everything you'll use is already instrumented with open te telemetry, but it will converge to that eventually because the forces behind open tracing, for example, are shifting officially to open telemetry. As far as, as, far as Nginx now, uh, uh, goes, I'm not familiar with the details there, but again, I don't see any problem re-instrumenting, either re-instrumenting Nginx with open telemetry or using the open tracing bridge um, for C, I guess, or C++, right? Uh, to, in, to basically, yeah, instrument Nginx with open telemetry. I'm, I mean, I hope I understood the question properly. Uh, I have a question about working with logs in, uh, if it, how it is rela related to spans, uh, and is it possible to store some log in span? And if yes, uh, no, I is it possible? to sto store some log information inside span. Yes, definitely. Let me mirror my screen again. Right, so here in my implementation, I'm logging an event, span.add event. Selected seniority, and then I'm uh, giving the answer here, selected. This is whatever the yep. randomization yep. chose. And then in my trace, here in seniority, I have logs here. So these are the events, and they are also timed within the span. So I can see that at millisecond 111.93, right, this is exactly the point where um, this event um, um, happens. So for example, if I'm doing a long-running database query, I'm assuming this is what you're uh, thinking about, then yeah, I could see when I got the answer. I could see how long it took. But specifically with database queries, I may want to create a dedicated span for the query, and then the whole span is for the query, and it's not just an event. An event could be... Um, the query returned, here is the data from the query. This is the actual data, assuming it doesn't contain secrets, otherwise it wouldn't send it to the backend. Yeah, and then you can see, yeah, and you can see the actual, I mean, this is the log, this is the contents that they mm -hmm. put in the instrumentation. But uh, in this case, uh, do, do we have like data duplication because we will write log anyway? Well, if you do produce logs and you produce the same information in the traces, yes, you will have duplication, right? But the idea is, I mean, it's hard to predict the future, but um, you know the people who advocate for um, observability, they say, don't use logs. I mean, use traces because you want to capture everything and log this way, and not the old school jumble of text way, you know? So this is, this is basically structured logging, so to speak, but it is also in the context of a specific span and not just, you know, JSON-based logging or... Yeah, but uh, usually we need to sample uh, or some... We only uh, our collect only one percent of uh, of uh, this information, but we logs, we need to handle everything. So in tracing, in tracing, you can sample. You don't have to sample. If you don't sample, and I mean, tracing is high, card high cardinality data, so it means that it produces a lot of information. It's hard to compress by nature, right? Uh, because there is not a lot of repetition inside the context of the traces. So yeah, I mean, storing traces, I personally don't have a lot of uh, experience with managing tracing backends, but I can imagine this 
can definitely be a problem if you're capturing everything. So the question is, how much retention do you want, right? How far back do you need, I don't know, compliance, whatever your business needs in order to store um, all the information. But you can use sampling. Sampling says um, capture every fifth request or capture only interesting requests and you have an algorithm that decides what interesting means. I don't know. You can, you can define your own sampler, right? Yeah, and isn't it possible just to merge log from external storage to span? Not uh, save it together, span and uh, log information, but merge it from external stores, storage. You mean to correlate traditional logging with tracing? Yeah. I'm not familiar with such an approach. Maybe there is one, but personally, I don't know about such a thing. Mm -hmm. well, okay, thank you. Sure. No more Anything questions? else? Yep. And so you can ask me in the office. <laughs> yeah, I know. Uh, can open telemetry also produce logs for the events, for example? So if you like want to use like your instrument or your application with the with the tracing, mm -hmm. and then also use that for just logging. Yes, um, one of the first uh, exporters that is implemented in every library is the STD out exporter. So if you use an STD out exporter, then every tracing event gets printed, and then you can collect that, and it's just like logging, structured logging, All right? Uh, but yeah, I mean it will be hard to search, etc. So. If you're using a tracing, if you're if you're doing tracing, you might as well use a tracing backend. Maybe comments or feature requests. No? I'm not one of the main. Uh, I'm not one of the maintainers, by the way. I'm just a contri contributor. My company got hired to help with implementing parts of the open telemetry libraries. So, yeah, you can request things, and maybe someone will see the video, and yeah, or I can post it as an issue on GitHub. But you can do it yourself as well. In this case, it was one tracing vendor, um, which yeah, decided to fund that. But like I said, it's a collaborative effort. So basically, funding-wise, I mean, the, the companies who pay the salary for all the contributors are, for example, Datadog, Lightstep, New Relic, uh, Microsoft, Google, companies like that. Right? It is worth it for them to uh, invest money in this effort. So yeah. Uh, thank you. Sure. Uh, if I have a, uh, an application that is not uh, instrumented at all, and it's like big and uh, big effort to instrument it, is it possible to have like a sidecar to somehow monitor something and collect some traces? Yeah, so this is called uh, black box tracing. Um, black, box, black box tracing was historically attempted in a couple of cases. Um, it, it turns out it doesn't work very well because Tracing is the kind of thing that, I mean, you really need it to be interlaced into your code in order for it to work because you're interested in specific parts of the code and not everything is technically observable from the outside, right? The kind of um, similar approach that uh, the project takes in order to save you from having to instrument, for example, because it's a lot of effort, is the auto-instrumentation feature where, for example, if you're using... Um, I don't know, one of the common frameworks, right? In Python, for example, if you're using Flask as a web framework, uh, in Go, we normally use the standard library, but maybe we use, this, we use some, I don't know, one of the microservices frameworks, and that framework is instrumented, right? Um, then, then, then you got it. And in other languages, less in Go, but for example, in Python, you can do funny things like monkey patching in order to kind of hijack parts of the code in order to do the tracing so you don't actually have to instrument the library the, the, that you're consuming, but in Go, this is trickier to do because of its the, the, the nature of the language. All right, let's give a round of applause for Johannes.